One of the issues that arises when people first encounter evolutionary biology is that of the style of thought. There are actually some substantial differences in the way that people think about things. And those are often implicit. And the purpose of this lecture is to make that issue explicit so that you can recognize it when you encounter it and you can understand what's going on. The three different styles of thought that I want to discuss today are typological thinking, population thinking, and tree thinking. Now, if one is thinking typologically, then the most important thing to know about something is the kind of thing that it is, that it represents a normal condition. This is a way of approaching the world that was first really formalized by Plato and Aristotle, Plato's theory of ideals and Aristotle's theory of types. And the type of Aristotle embodies the essence of the thing. Now, there are many places in science where this works pretty well. For example, the hydrogen atom. If we just think of all hydrogen atoms as having a nucleus and a single electron, proton and an electron orbiting around it, we do pretty well. Uh, the vertebrate kidney. Now, in terms of understanding basic physiology, we don't need to worry very much about the variation between individuals and the performance of their kidneys. We need to understand the countercurrent exchange mechanisms and Henley's loop and the way that uh, the kidney filters such a huge volume of blood every day but manages to retain the water, things like that. Or the eukaryotic ribosome. It's really not so important that we understand little variations in the shape of the ribosome. The essential thing is that it is a rather large RNA enzyme structure that has a hole in the middle of it through which the messenger RNA passes in such a way that the transfer RNA with its amino acid fits precisely into place. And those are good examples where if you've seen one of them, you've seen all of them. And that's where typological thinking works well. So those conditions are ones where the average properties of a thing are much more important than its variation. That's sometimes the case in molecular and cell biology and physiology, but not always. It is a powerful simplification that makes life easier. One of the reasons it's so tempting is that you can deal with the world efficiently by making it less complex. So the important thing to know about typological thinking is when can you get away with it? It's going to mislead you when thinking about evolution or about the adaptive immune system or about many other things whose basic mechanism is based on variation. So here are examples where typological thinking works. We think about the eukaryotic cell. It's got certain characteristics. It has a cell membrane. It has a nucleus. It's got a Golgi apparatus. It's got endoplasmic reticulum. It's got lysosomes and so forth. And we just think of those things as sort of the standard kit of the eukaryotic cell. Of course, as soon as you get into developmental biology, the ways that it can be changed, the ways that it can vary are very important. Or when we think about protein synthesis, we have the central dogma of molecular biology. DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And that can be laid out inside the space of a cell in a way that leads to a very standard process that we can imagine going on from bacterial cells through human cells. Uh, and it's useful to have that kind of simplification. So that's typological thinking. In contrast, we have population thinking. And for people who've been used to typological thinking, thinking about variation actually requires a bit of a conceptual leap. That happens when the most important thing to know about something is the variation in the population from which it's drawn. In other words, what kind of a thing when it's, is it when we compare it to the other kinds of things that it might be? That is directly tied to Darwin's insight into the central role of variation in natural selection. 
if you go back to the first lecture in this series, you will see how frequently the word variation comes up. Variation in reproductive success, variation in the trait, genetic variation. In other words, natural selection runs on variation. Examples where you have to use population thinking are gene frequencies, relative risk of heart disease, as it might be stratified by sex and lifestyle, or uh, personalized medicine, which means you're going to get a treatment which is specifically designed to deal with your individual genome in contrast to all of the other variant genomes that exist in the human population. So this point of view emphasizes variation in the population and the processes that change it. And an individual is seen as a sample whose traits can be estimated from population frequencies. It's useful whenever it's important to know whether and how fast something will evolve. So if you're going to think about these things, it's important to think about them as population properties. Antibiotic resistance, pathogen virulence, cancer malignancy, and anything related to the microbiome are all medical issues where population thinking is going to help you and typological thinking is probably going to deceive you. It forces us to conceptualize frequency distributions. It forces us to think about patterns of variation in space and time. And it forces us to think about probabilities rather than certainties. And that is a conceptual leap. So population thinking, it's important. Here's an example where we see some data that shows how one might encounter antibiotic resistance. This was done in George Church's group uh, at Harvard. And what they did was they took gut microbiome isolates from two individuals. Neither of these individuals had used antibiotics for more than a year. And what you see here is a description of how much the individual isolates in the microbiome varied in their resistance to a series of antibiotics. So the antibiotics are rows and the columns are individual isolates, and the darkness of the reaction shows how well that particular isolate grows on that particular antibiotic. So the darker the color, the more resistance there is. And just by looking at this kind of display, you can see that individual human individual one has a lot more resistant isolates in the microbiome than did individual human two. But you also see that there's a great deal of variation among the isolates in their ability to resist particular antibiotics. This can be broken down into the percent of isolates that are resistant to each antibiotic. And you can see that there's a fair amount of variation. Individual, the orange individual, has quite a bit more. But there's very little re uh, resistance here to chloramphenicol. But there's quite a bit of resistance to things like penicillin and so forth. You can also see the uh, number of antibiotics to which a uh, particular isolate is resistant uh, was quite high in this individual. The average was about 10. And in this individual, it was about 6 or 7. So these are gut microbiomes that are 572 isolates in each case from huge populations. They're probably about mm, 10 to the 17th uh, individual bacteria in the human gut. They constitute usually about 1,200, 1,500 different species of bacteria. So we're looking at about, say, a third of the different types of bacteria in the human gut. And you know, the take-home message here really is you pick an average human at random out of a population, hasn't been taking antibiotics, and the bugs that are living in their gut have a lot of genes for resistance for a lot of antibiotics. They can ship that information around through horizontal gene transfer, uh, and it's quite possible that uh, if, for example, this person starts taking, let's say, something like penicillin here, then all of the white isolates are going to drop out. Or if they start taking cephdenir here in the blue person, all of these bacterial species are going to be eliminated, giving these a competitive advantage. 
what might that result in? Well, it could result in diarrhea. It could result in uh, an increase in a tendency to become obese. It could result in a decreased manufacture of critical vitamins. It could do a lot of things. So the important thing is that we see here a lot of variation, and we are thinking about samples from a big population. And then when we think about interventions, we can see that selection is going to operate on that variation and produce a change. What about cancer? Every cancer is an independent evolutionary process. It starts from a single founder cell. There are mutations. Those mutations produce descendant clones. Those clones vary in their properties depending on what kind of mutation they've had. They compete with each other. They undergo selection pressures to compete for space and nutrients. They eventually acquire the ability to move and they become metastases invading new tissue. In those new tissues, they adapt to the tissues. This has been demonstrated, for example, a pancreatic cancer that is metastasizing into liver and kidney and brain will become adapted to the different tissues. And then if we apply chemotherapy, this is therapy right here, what happens is that we eliminate everything but the resistant clone. We select the resistant clone. It remains. It remains a problem. It spreads. And if we come back and try to treat it again with chemotherapy, we have to switch drugs. If we hit it very hard, we will e very efficiently select the next such clone because this one will be giving rise to daughter clones by mutation and so forth. So what's going on here is that a cancer is not a single thing. It is a population of clones, each of which consists of thousands to millions of cells. And as it moves into different parts of the body, they are like ecosystems to which those cells are becoming adapted, and chemotherapy will select for the resistant clones. So that is not thinking about cancer as a single typological thing. That's thinking about cancer as a population of evolving entities. Now, tree thinking. Tree thinking means thinking about not about redwoods and pines, but about phylogenetic trees. And if you are a person who is adept at tree thinking and you like this kind of biology, then you think that the most important thing to know about something is its position in a phylogenetic tree. In other words, what's its evolutionary history, who are its relatives, and what can I understand about it by understanding its past and its relationships. So this all derives from the insight that all species on Earth, at least that are the ones that are not viruses, are members of a single tree of life. Life originated once, and all species are descendant from that ancestor. Species then are not independent replicates within a larger class, but they are connected within a phylogenetic tree. This kind of thinking emphasizes explanations within the context of a tree in which differences arise by divergence from the last shared ancestor. So tree thinking is useful whenever we can get insight from comparisons among species. And in evolutionary medicine, such comparisons are useful when we think about, for example, the fact that primates like us, actually the hominids, particularly humans, have very invasive placentas in which the fetal stem cells are invading the endometrium to build the placenta, and those stem cells have many properties of cells that then form in later life metastatic cancer. Of course, it helps us with understanding the association of upright posture with problems in childbirth. It helps us understand why whales and elephants, which have thousands to millions of times more cells in their body than we do, don't all die of colon cancer when they are teenagers. It helps us to understand why, it helps us to see that that's a problem. It helps us understand, for example, that if we were to look at African green monkeys and realize that they have simian immunovirus, but they don't get AIDS, that we could understand something important about resistance to AIDS by looking at a relative that has the, a very similar virus but doesn't get sick. And we can also understand something about heart disease and why we are susceptible to our particular kind of heart disease 
by seeing that heart disease is quite different in chimpanzees. And the way that fat forms and that plaques form and things like that in chimpanzees is quite different. So knowing where on the tree of life a condition is present or absent gives us immediately a clue as to its correlates and its probable causes. So let's think about birth for a moment. And what we have here on the left are sketches of the birth canal and the infant cranium. The infant cranium is the black dot, the birth canal is the oval around it. In a series of monkeys, and this is the gibbon, uh, this is the uh, orangutan, this is the chimpanzee, gorilla, and man. Now, you might say, well, uh, look, the macaque has just as much a problem in birth as does the human, and it is a relative, so that could be an ancestral condition that we inherited and not something that changed in humans. But if you put them on a phylogenetic tree, then you realize that the closest relative of humans is the chimpanzee. And therefore, we need to compare this picture with this picture. And you can see that the birth canal in the chimpanzee, by comparison to the human, is quite capacious. It has lots of room for the infant head to come through, whereas the birth canal in humans is constricted. And there is a good reason for that. We walk upright and our pelvis has been remodeled so that we have to have support for our internal organs. And the other thing that's happened is that the human baby, because of our increased cranial capacity and our increased cognitive capacity, is investing a lot in the size of its brain before it comes out. And those two things collide. And that is one of the things that makes birth so difficult in humans. So, there's quite a bit to understand about reproductive biology by looking at comparisons like this. So, to summarize, people think about stuff in very different ways. And you need to be able to match the way you think to the problem that you're trying to solve. Population and tree thinking are standard in evolutionary biology. And they are ways of looking at the world that emphasize the importance of variation, frequency, probability, history, and comparison. And if you can become fluent in those sorts of thinking, modes of thinking, modes of thought, uh, you will gain quite a bit of intellectual power in trying to understand why things are the way they are.